Okay, I think I might have used the wrong word, advanced. I should just say iOS tips and tricks, and that might have, you know, tempered down the expectations. But really what I want to talk about is I've learned, a, I think, a lot of things over the last seven years that I've been doing iOS development. And I think a lot of that can be uh, applied to just in mobile, mobile in general. So um, time for some philosophy. Now, this is probably, designers in the room will probably know more of what I'm talking about here. But I think it's important as developers that we keep this stuff in mind. Um, think of your customers more than you think of yourself. That might be kind of a charge statement, but I see so much software that's written that's just the focus isn't on the end user experience. It really is about how quick I can get something done. And that's OK, but when you put in someone else's hands, um, you know, their expectations uh, of your company and, and, and how you're viewed uh, can be summed up with you know, that experience. So design is how something functions, not necessarily how it looks. Um, I had a uh, very, very brief conversation with an individual that wanted to retain my services. And I asked him if he had a designer on staff or access to the designer. And his answer was no, I don't think that's important. And so that was the end of that. So um, to me, design is very important. And it's not about how it looks. It really is about how it works. And then how people you know, use it and how they feel about what you're doing. I think that's very important. So if you're going to give anyone any type of emotional, uh, anything emotional with it, hopefully it's happiness and not like they hate your guts. Right? So user experience and details matter. And I found the best way to learn is by imitating. Um, so I'll look at an app or the way something functions, and I'll try to figure out how they did it. And then I'll create a sample project to kind of see how they did it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But and then again, you know, practice, practice, and practice again. If you get it down, practice some more. So you get put in the time. There's no shortcuts. All right. Now every time I'm out here, someone can accuse me of having this really lawn, big lawn. I keep telling I get off my lawn for stuff. So this is uh, saying that um, it's big enough for everyone. So I won't tell anybody to get off my lawn this time. But uh, everything I'm, hopefully, that I'm going to talk about, people are going to take to heart. Now, I'm going to give you a, an example of bad design here. Um, to kind of preface this, my, um, or rather, yeah. So my two-year-old daughter, um, she's two and a half now, loves this app called Gumby. And I'm old enough where Gumby was like this little Gumby looking dude with the hair, the thing, whatever. So it's, it's like kind of a cartoon kind of, kind of, kind of thing. And, uh, the version one of the software, you would uh, buy access to their videos, and you can stream them. And I guess they figured out that that got really expensive. So the next version, you could buy the videos, but they were stored locally on the device. OK. So, so I decided to run through an actual process of what my daughter went through. So I, this is an actual video here. So the first thing we try to do is I start downloading the videos, and then when she does, she starts tapping on all the videos because she wants to view them. And if you notice, that very top right bar kind of slows down. And I'm scrolling, I'm tapping, there's no video, right? Now, I've got a lot more patience than a two-year-old, OK? Now, this came about because her brother decided, was that? I said, I don't know. I've worked with you in the past. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, her brother, Seven, decided to delete the app just to mess with her. So we installed the app again and had to restore our purchases. And as you can see what's going on here, I can't do anything. Scrolling up and down, tapping, nothing's happening. Things look kind of cool. I'll get frustrated in a second here. Is it downloading everything? Yes. Everything Yes. Oh, man, what a waste. Right. Is it so, charging for each tab? <laughs> so now, OK, load up the app. OK, it's taking too long. Let's load it up again. Imagine your two-year-old have to wait. Oh, what's this? 
She taps on the button, goes to the app store. Right? Now she's starting to whine. Here's the home button. Lunge the app again. This is a recording of what your daughter is doing too. Yeah. And then, boop, again. <laughs> Still no video, right? Take a while, guess how many times she's going to do this? Well, they took two months to make that intro, so they didn't have any And time. then, oh, there's a pop up. She can't read, right? <laughs> so, what's she going to do? She's going to tap a button. Okay, well, that goes to the app store again. Okay? I don't know if there's a fourth or fifth time. Tap on the video button, and now it's still downloading. Okay. At this point, I'm frustrated. I'm mad because she's upset and about to destroy the iPad because she's smashing it, smacking with her fingers and everything, getting really, really upset. So I wanted to, to, to get a sense to show you guys like how in the real world decisions can, you know, may seem kind of uh, small. But then I'm going to decide to delete the app and get rid of it. So, so that, so development, and of course, there's my rocking chair. Um, so, understand who your customers are. In that case, I'm not the customer, even though I'm paying for it. My daughter is the customer, and that's who it's for. Okay? So, optimize for that experience. In my opinion, they're, they optimize for revenue pop-ups that she can't read. And, and that's, not on, that's not an accident, right? So um, that's why I get really, really frustrated. And of course, my lawn issue comes up. And I, you know, in the course of that is sometimes less is more. Stakeholders often know the end result, and your job is often how to help them get, get from A to B. And so that statement is more of a person will tell me, I really want this really awesome feature. It's an awesome thing. And then I ask the question, OK, that's great. And how do we get there from here? What's our first step? And, and I ask that so they can get in their mind, so we're all on the same page, but in their mind, how, how are we going to do that? Often people know, have the vision, here's the wireframes, and make that. And it's like there's a lot of decisions that go from nothing to this mock up. There's a lot of things that, hap that happen. Um, and then you want to go right against futuritis disease. I'm um, always thinking the more features will get more downloads and more engagement. Sometimes it works. I find a lot of times it just makes it overly complicated. So in, in my apps, I, I try to err on simplicity as much as I can. Um, and, then, and then add if I really, really need to add it. And then have empathy for your fellow human. Um, a lot of times it's easy for us to sit behind a computer and bang out some code and not think about um, how we affect people who, who use our software. So, okay, now to the fun stuff. This will be a very short uh, meeting. All right, <clears throat> so I want to show a couple of apps. Um, I'm going to do some code here, and about what I what I did right and what I did wrong. Now, uh, this app in particular, I wrote this probably was it two. 2012? Yeah, 2012. Um, so about three and a half years ago. Um, and I did some things that I thought were kind of awesome at the time. And then I paid for it two and a half, three years later, because I had to still maintain that. New versions of Xcode come out, new compilers. You get bigger you know, widescreen phones now. So um, this is an, a perfect case study, but just to kind of show uh, what did right, what did wrong, and quote example. But before I get to that, let me switch inputs here. Is it one? All right. Or do do do. Here we go. Okay, so the app in question, who oh, doesn't crash on me? And it crashed. Look at that. Okay. So right there, what's the problem? Please wait. Okay, problem number one. Okay, I shouldn't have to wait for weather data. I should just be like that. 
Now, um, not to be throwing a lot of stones, but um, the API that this is written against was written about a decade ago, to put that in perspective. So um, people like to reuse what they already have on the back end, and that's great, but sometimes that doesn't make for a really good experience. And in the process of developing this app initially, they said, oh, just extend the timeout. Just add another five seconds, man, 10 seconds. I'm like, the guy, the person's waiting. You know, they're going to leak the app. They're going to be upset. And I'm going to bear the brunt of it why the app sucks. So uh, to any server people out there, please, please make an API for us that's easy for us to use and consume. So um, anyway, it's called Skies. Um, it's on the App Store uh, for uh, Omaha World Herald. It's, it's their app. Um, this is the non-branded version of this. Um, but the few features I want to I kind of go over, like we've got this you know, slide over kind of view. Wow, that's really interesting. You know, on both sides. Um, this is considered kind of bad design nowadays because I'm, I'm kind of hiding what you can do and you don't really know where you are. So, um, but I'll, I'll show you how to make said bad design. A um, couple things here at the bottom. You can scroll back and forth, and it kind of will snap to the actual, to the correct hour, and then it kind of animates. If you notice the, um, the moon, let's go to the day sign. Kind of, kind of blends in, and then there's a little wind dial at the bottom that also moves as well, depending on the wind. Now, the problem I've, I've had uh, with something like this is that um, whenever the user decides to do something, I'm always making a call. Um, ideally, what I should have done is cached a bunch of data on the device. Instead of doing every once an hour, just grab a block of 24 or something like that. And that way, it would appear to be more immediate as the user is swiping through the hours. And I didn't do that. So any, any network issues they have immediately show up in the UI here. Um, I mean, our early view here is kind of choppy. You know, I'm kind of dropping some frames, doing a lot of processing I don't need to do, that kind of thing. Um, any questions so far? When you were looking at the uh, hour by hour forecast, were you saying you retrieve the data at every click? Like when they clicked on it, then you retrieve the data? Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and it's still going. Right, so, and then it fills in. This view right here was a hill to die on for me. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys know what that means. I would complain and say, this is taking way too long. I want to get everything in one shot. And it's like, well, you just do it hour by hour, just do it by day by day, fill it in, it'll be fine. So um, I thought it made for a really bad experience. Yes, sir? Back in dependency, they gave it to you by the client? Yes. Well, they already, they already had it in place, and then wanted to reuse what they had. And so things like latency, uh, the fact that it's XML and that JSON, and it's unstructured XML on top of that, so a lot of processing that you have to do on the, on the, on the phone, um, just made it bad. So is it an API call for every single cell on your table? Yes. Wow. Because making one call for all of them, it would just time out because they're doing a lot of processing on their end. Gotcha. I'm like, just cache it. But, you know, I don't do the back end, so. Sorry. Yes, yeah. Right. Were there, uh, I mean, it was basically like a um, fixed bid or no maintenance situation where you had to just kind of like, you know, guarantee quality over a period of time? Or is there, are these things that they would have been receptive to like adding as additional features later? Um, that's a good question. I, I think. Using the background, you know, periodically queuing up background processes. Right, well, the, the thing they, they recommended to me was to use threads. Okay. And I said to the guy, I'm like, well, I, I am. I'm using Grand Central Dispatch, right? So there's a problem. <laughs> I mean, either way, th there's an issue here. This, this app, I mean, you're my world hero, mm -hmm. so big. This app used a lot? Because if it is, I would surpri be surprised if they haven't since then, three years or right. ago, have cached this data. Uh, no, it's not used a lot. Um, it, it was under a different, uh, different name. 
a different branded app that they had a few years before that. And so I wanted this to be like a 1.0, just completely separate, different app. And they said, no, we're going to upgrade everything. And so it was never in the App Store, and no one really got to use it, except for me complaining at every 15 minutes past the hour, they get a new data dump, and everything kind of can't, can't it times out. So um, I'm hammering these guys a little bit because while it looks kind of cool, right? The experience, in my opinion, is, is ruined. The functionality, right? So the design is bad, in, 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 my, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> right. Thank you. So on the map here, you want to zoom in. Well, it's kind of nice out here, so we can kind of zoom out. And you have this kind of radar view as you can kind of pan over. And we refresh, OK. Now, what's interesting about this view is it is an animated set of images over a map that you can pan. And this probably took me a long time to work, get it working. And this is the best I can do. I mean, it's just, it's just bad, but it's the best I can do. I went, I've talked to the people who make the maps API and said, this is what I'm doing. Here's the code. And like, well, it's up to be you, but that's all you can do. Was it difficult just to get the accuracy of where the radar was? What was the difficult part? Um, the difficult part is memory. Okay. Right? So because you have, a, a, you have a situation where I have relatively higher resolution. I say high resolution. Meteorologists can tell me that's high resolution or not. But imagery here that I can pinch and zoom and move around. But the requirement was that it had to move you know, as you're panning and still kind of animate a little bit. See that? So, um, so what ends up happening, you get a really, really big image, and your viewport is only what you see, but I'm still having to load the stuff that you don't see in memory. If it was a tiled approach, then, as you, then it'd be you know, much less of an issue with memory, because I'm only pulling in, displaying what, what I need to display in memory, instead of having this big, honking image times so many hours. So the, the back end code on, on the app that does this basically has a, um, an overlay that has a timer that goes through and cycles the images, dumps down the cache, pulls in the cache, that kind of thing. So um, I think it's kind of cool looking. But you get to a bigger phone, like a 6 Plus, app can't handle it. Because now I've got a bigger surface area to render. So kind of kind of sucks. But, but anyway, um, and then you have this little dial here at the bottom, um, this little button here. Um, this, now, in my defense, I wrote this when iOS 6 was still the, the, the rage. Um, so before 7 and 8. And um, there's something, and I'll get into some of this code, how this works, actually. Because, excuse me, there's a mix, mix, mixture of views and layers and clipping and all that kind of stuff to make it look kind of decent. But one thing I'm kind of proud of is this loop feature where I can tap and I can hold and I can kind of move around and then it drops a pin. And um, that, was, was to, that was to fix a problem where if you wanted to drop a pin on exactly a, a certain spot, you couldn't do it because you couldn't see it because your thumb's in the way. And so this was a way of, of uh, seeing what's underneath your thumb. Can you show that again? Yeah. And you notice that this doesn't. So is it like, like what, is, what are you seeing on your screen? It's just above this thumb. It's just above yep. the thumb. Yep. So for example, the, Getty, the Galesburg there, now my thumb's right over it. Okay. Right. So it's whatever you're, you're, you can't see, that's, that's what that does. Now, uh, consequently of, of writing code that is also uh, dealing with fixed width uh, devices, is if I decide to add this as a favorite, you know this is off-centered. On the iPhone 5 and 5S, it, it looks perfect. But here, it's kind of off to the left. Because I'm assuming in the code that, write, that, that draws all this that there's 320 pixels or points across. So don't do that. Um, yeah. Questions so far? No? OK, cool. Did your data source know it? 
No, uh, these guys are affiliated with the University of Colorado. Okay. That's all I really know about that out there in Boulder. So the data is pretty, pretty good from what I can tell. Um, my wife uses the radar as like her gospel for it's going to rain. The picture says it's going to rain, right? So the good thing is, is that it's, it's pretty accurate placement on the map. So we can definitely kind of zoom in and see. So if, um, if I zoom out, oops, I'm just up kind of north there. There we go. Now, the problem with, with having a slow connection is that as I'm panning and zooming, every time I stop, I have to ask the server for more, more radar. Maybe I have it, maybe I don't, right? Based off the zoom, right? So some, sometimes it works. Oh, um, no, it's not so much. It's whenever you've um, so whenever you you tap uh, radar or precipitation, then I go out and say, for the next so many hours, future radar, bring all that in. So you can zoom in here. Now what it's going to do is it sees kind of fuzzy. It's going to try to get new images and redraw at the different resolution, and then you kind of get in and get a little further in. So it's just getting kind of choppy when you do that. So anyway, um, so if I. So when you're looking at like, uh, like at, at this scale, mm -hmm. how are, are you, like you're clearly loading more radar data outside of it. Is right. There, like depending on the zoom scale, like how much extra are you loading? That's a good question. Um, essentially what I do is when you change the, um, the range, the scale factor, I forget what it's called off the top of my head. Um, there is a URL that's generated. I send it back to this. Well, actually, I ask the server, hey, I have this range. What, what images do I have? It'll say, here are the URLs. And I'll check my local cache if I have it. If I do, then I use it. If I don't, then I pull it down. But it still takes the time for me to go to the server to go figure that out. I, I guess I'm saying, like, how, like, you're looking at the screen. Uh -huh. It's loading more data outside yes. of the visible range. Yes. Is there, the, 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 the server has some algorithm that figures out how much more to pull? Yeah, I send it basically what my area is, where my viewport is. Okay. And I'm getting a really big map. So y when you pan over, you don't see stuff being kind of chopped off. That was the idea. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get a, a let's see, Holy, Holly Springs. Let's save that. OK. So. What's supposed to happen is, and this is added as an actual favorite. So on the, the right-hand side of the screen, it'll give you your high and your low. And it's supposed to check for any type of uh, National Weather Service alerts. I'm pretty sure there's something there. Um, oh, maybe not. What do we have an alert right now, Jim? We shouldn't have one. No. All right. All right, let's, there we go. So now I get this error here, All right? And I, and I can't refresh the data, All right? So my only recourse is to, um, well, let's see if I can, uh, here we go, get it from Omaha. All right, now some of the stuff that's interesting is, um, for example, I can search for anything, anywhere. I'll say Paris, for example. And I'll, and I'll get to choose which Paris I want. And it was kind of an interesting way of finding different sister cities. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> so if I. Uh, to the Paris, France, or to the South? <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? So, so right now, it's 2.19 AM in Paris time. So um, and one of the things that was really, really difficult to do was to treat local, or sorry, data not from your location as local data. It's, it's iOS is still kind of hard to, to do time zone stuff correctly. Yeah. Uh, it really is a pain in the butt, uh, to put it mildly. Um, but anyway, so you can search for anywhere and just say, you know, what's like over there? You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, any questions so far? Any comments before I get into some of this code? 
You guys want to see any code that drives any of this? Yeah. Awesome. You guys are too kind. All right. Let's see, here we go. Not to mess with this. this, this is really, really tiny. Okay, so this project is ridiculous, the amount of code that's in there. To put this mildly, it's ridiculous. Um, if I were to run my, um, I just want to see like how many lines of code that I've written for this project. Um, is this all of yours? Um, or is it a team? No, it was only me. Oh, well, yeah. Travis helped a little bit. Okay. I gotta throw that in there. <laughs> no, so right now it's like almost 10k worth of code just to do that. A lot of it is drawing and shapes and and some animation, some custom animation stuff. Um, all right, so if I go into, you know what? Let me grab something real quick. Nope, no, don't need it, don't need it. How do you zoom in on this? Control? Bastards. Well, just the, just the uh, screen itself to zoom. I'll have to go into the actual code itself and, and do it. That's fine. All right. So the, the screen, um, and this is, this is all pre-storyboard. Um, yeah. um, this is all nibs, or exibs, I guess, at this point. Um, detail, detail, detail. OK. Is that better? Yeah. Or is that too big? That's good. All right. Sorry. <laughs> OK. So let me go to the top here. Yeah, so 2012. I wrote this. Um, so a couple of things. Um, um, with this is. Just as, as a tip, if you do any type of formatting, like number formatting or date formatting, cache it, save it locally. And there's a variable that helps. I know Kevin likes to make kind of a global variable. I'm not a global kind of guy, so I like to keep it uh, specific to my controller. Um, and um, so yeah, so this, this uh, Detail view controller drives the main screen. So if I can uh, pull up uh, the actual source or the actual uh, view here. And that really cuts that off, doesn't it? OK. So that controller controls this whole thing. Now, one of the things I want to I want to show you guys is this little thing here that slides over. Uh, it's very very simple to do. 
extremely simple to do. It's not, it's not hard. I see a lot of apps that, that, that do that. Not that I recommend you do it in the future, but just as kind of how you do it. Um, typically what I do, let's see if that works. If I inspect my view here without it crashing. OK. So um, actually, let me open that up and then do it. Thought that was going to work. One more time. Maybe not. All right. Whatever. OK. That doesn't work. Um, typically, what I do, if I look at the um, oh, delegates here. Oh, when you start having 8, 9, 10, 20,000 lines of code, organization is key. I know that sounds obvious, but when you start just banging out code and adding classes and that kind of stuff, it becomes really hard to find stuff. Um, so one of the first things that I do when I create uh, this type of thing is I always create a root view controller. And no matter what I put in it, whether it's a storyboard or whatever the case is, I always launch it with that. And that allows me to um, essentially layer my views on top of each other. So in fact, the, um, the um, let me find it here. So we files, resources, views, root. Come on. Are you in the process of updating this? Or you mentioned this code was three years ago, but yeah. you have Fabric commented out. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't no, yeah, I updated it recently, and um, since uh, um, Test Flight got purchased by Apple and didn't quite work for someone like myself, I went Fabric. Fabric is awesome. So, yeah. Um, so I have these different views here, and in the in in well, let me look here. In code, what I do is I typically have a content view, as I call it. And in code, I'll actually stuff other, other nibs into that view so I can see it. And I'll be able to move it around and animate it. Um, I'm trying to find an actual good example of that that works. OK. All right. Now, this root controller does a lot of things. It, it covers. The, the bar at the top, we can, you can put in whatever, whatever, um, whatever location that you want. It handles the navigation. Um, in fact, I have this, this method called display control at index. And all the controllers have uh, different, uh, like the uh, detail maps and all that. They're all into their own, into an actual array. And this code actually handles how I can switch between them all. The problem with this approach is that they are pre-allocated ahead of time, and they're not dynamically allocated. So that also means that as I switch from one controller to the next, I'm incurring the memory of that. So if I'm doing a lot of stuff in the map, and you switch over to detail, the map is still going, that kind of thing. Um, what's that? So does it also impact? It does. Well, it, it, it did. With the 6, 6 plus, you don't really notice it as much, but it's still wasteful. It, it really is. Um, and, 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 and originally the reason I, I did it that way is because data would take so long to load is that I would actually just do it at startup. While you're waiting for the spinner, it's doing everything else. So that's, and that's a good way to do it. But this really is kind of an old school way if you want to swap views in and out, controllers, that way. So I make calls to view will disappear, did appear, to make sure that the, the life cycle of a view controller is handled uh, properly and that it didn't disappear and all that kind of thing. Quick question. Kind of going back to yes. Are you sure that uh, XIV that had the three views on it 
Uh -huh. Is there uh, like an overriding owning view controller to that that has like its primary view and then other views, or is it just an object that has outward? No, it's 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 the root view controller that owns that owns all of that. Okay, so it has its own outlets to the three view op view controller objects. Well, it is is uh, an outlet to the views themselves. Um, I didn't use actual view controllers as objects in the nib. Okay. That was actually done here in, in, in the code. Um, so actually, here, create controllers. Okay. Okay. There they are. Um, and another thing, too, uh, I know there was a, a, a talk a couple months ago, I think, about uh, retain cycles and things of that nature. Um, one way to get around that is to use the delegate pattern. I use that quite extensively. Um, so in that way, the, uh, the map, well, the map uh, can tell me, well, actually, no. Let me get the backwards. Yeah. So the, so the, um, the map will know, or I think maybe I will know, the root controller knows when a person changes location on the map. When that happens, then all the other data is, is allocated, or sorry, is changed. So if I pan the map and set a pin, then the map tells its delegate, which is the root controller, hey, I got a new location. And the root controller says, all oh, my children, here's a new location. So it's kind of a proxy, and everything kind of filters down that way. Not the most efficient, but it works. Um, and this update all locations here. Yeah. So, and there's a timer. Uh, every hour on the hour, it's going to update its weather regardless, because I'm considering it stale. So you let it sit there for an hour, it actually will figure out how many minutes past the hour you are and you know, that kind of thing, which really sucks. But it works. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, da, 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 where is it? So you keep all the, all the views open for the days, weekly, and everything, and you change the location in the background of all, each one of the controllers will still have an instance of it, so it's actually updating its location information at the same time? Right. Now, to get around that bad dis design decision, I would have a method to say, am I actually visible? So that if the controller, who is not visible, but is still running in the background, gets a notification that you have a, a lo new location, it doesn't have to fire everything off. So I made a workaround for my workaround, which is I mean, that's just, that, that's just a bad day. <laughs> that's just a bad day. Um, all right, so, so on, the, on the map, uh, a couple things I wanted to show. Um, oh, goodness. Let's do this. OK. So, um, so one of the things I wanted to do was to, when you pressed on the map, did a long press, and popped the little, the little loop, OK? Now, we tried a lot of different gestures. We found out that, that other gestures would interfere with the regular panning and zooming, pinching on the map. So we chose a long press. Um, and that seemed, that seemed to work just fine. Um, but it was on the actual parent view. So if you've got the map on the view, the parent view is the one that's actually intercepting that gesture. That seemed to work okay. Um, but anyway, so this this display loop at point. Let's see my cursor here. I just arbitrarily picked a you know seventy points from testing. Right, it's nothing special about that. Um, I created a special loop view that actually will be the actual rectangle that has a, essentially a hole cut through it, so you don't see the edges. And Again, this is written three years ago. It's kind of an old school way of doing it, but it works. Um, I added the loop view to the view with the parent view and not to the map. Add to the map, then it gets kind of crazy with that. Um, and then I will actually animate it scaling up. So it just kind of pops. And, um, and then I have to set a center point. And then I'll say magnify for point. Now, if you notice, there's a lot of dispatch async peppered throughout the code. 
Um, some people like to use uh, the GCD, the C version. Some people like to use NS Operation Q. This right one. Um, I don't know why there's two. So I've always kind of defaulted to the C version. Nothing is better or anything like that. But this code right here is what actually draws the map, the little view into the map, or the uh, map into the, uh, the loop itself. Um, I can't exactly take complete credit for this brilliance. I went and found s code that did something like this, and I cleaned it up. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I cleaned it up. Um, yeah. You don't have to understand, but it works. So um, in, in this case, you go from Objective C directly into the C API very, very naturally here. Um, and essentially, I'm, I'm taking a snapshot of whatever your finger is on, and I'm transposing that onto the actual uh, loop view itself, into, onto its actual layer. And that's what allows you to do that. So, so I can definitely, if you guys like, want to like, have access to some of this stuff, I can just say, here, you know, this is how you do it. So anyway, um, not a lot of code, but then there's also a timer. Because the problem I ran into is the moment you first put your, 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 your thumb on the screen and you hold it down, it takes that one snapshot, but that's it. Right? So it, it, as you move it around, it's pretty static. So what we try to do is, I think every second or so, uh, just update that snapshot if, if, you're, if it's visible. If not, you don't worry about it. So a little bit of sleight of hand going on with that. Um, this code here. Moving to a super view, I needed to, to know when I actually had a, um, a parent. And then I can set the corner radius and border color and masks and all that kind of good stuff on, on, and on the layer itself. And that seems to work. Any questions so far? No? OK, cool. How am I doing so far? You guys all right? Nobody's falling asleep except for Kevin? <laughs> Are you guys learning anything? Anything new? How about you? No? OK. I'll keep going. So I guess one question would be kind yeah. of scroll through. You were talking about yeah. how you update the, the image right there uh -huh. after like every second. Mm -hmm. Because like it's moved, and you have the old snapshot. Mm -hmm. but you're taking a larger snapshot than what is being displayed in that individual rectangle. Either every second or every time you move, yeah. OK, so every movement or every mm -hmm. second that okay. Yep. And so if you notice there's a bit of delay, if, you, if you're doing that right on top of the radar, it'll be a bit of a delay where like, you'll see like, th like a poke a hole through it, and then it pops and poke a hole through it, and it pops. So, okay. so that's, that's the update then. Yep, that's the update. Um, yeah. So um, you know, when I first started doing this, um, you know, we'd have storyboards. All we had was were nibs. And um, I mean, this is kind of getting in the weeds a little bit, but you know, once you understand how views work, you can do a lot of really, really cool stuff with them. Really, really awesome stuff that people think, oh, you're a wizard. Like, no, it's pretty simple. So <clears throat> anyway, moving on here. <sighs> so there's a, just a ton of stuff here. I won't, won't go through it all, but, um, but if I'm looking at, let's say, this guy here, and display search results. Now, I want to show you guys this, because this is the animation where you search for something, you get more than one result. It kind of slides the UI up, and there's the actual you know, kind of a table view. Um, the way I do, I, I, I position a lot of this stuff off screen. So I create it off screen, and then I kind of animate everything up together. Um, and you know, when you start seeing code like this, you, know, you, you can get kind of tricky if you're not using, um, in this case, I'm using the height and the width of the window. So it, it but if initially it didn't, and that it was just 320 pixels wide, and I forget the actual height, and it was like off when I got this, when I got the iPhone 6. So part of my update was to make sure that if we have like an iPad or really, really big, you know, thing that 
this will work with it just fine. Excuse me. Um, when you start getting to things like, sorry, this animate with duration, um, all your animations get, get coalesced into, I think, a single transaction if they're in, inside of this uh, kind of block here. So I try to do everything I can um, right there. So this content view is, is what the detail controller sits in. Um, and, and I animate both of them essentially at the same time. That gives that kind of look that they kind of, one's pushing the one out of the way. And then uh, I set the alpha to zero, so it kind of fades out as it, go, as it goes up. So anyway. So um, that's it for that one. OK. And then where's that slide out drawer? Talk on navigation. OK, so a um, couple things here. This really gets into the weeds a little bit. Um, I have this Boolean of, should I really reveal the navigation or not? Because essentially what you have is you have the, 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 um, the side menu isn't really a side menu. It, it stretches the full length of the full, me, full width of the device. So the layers are stacked on top of each other. And we're literally just moving one layer this way. That's it. That's all I'm doing. Sliding it over and sliding it back. That's all it is. Looks cool, but it's really nothing. That's all it is to it. And um, I picked the 273 picks points. Um, it was 90% of 320, but it's no longer anymore. So um, yeah. Questions so far? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That that's that's all in code. Um, yeah. So, all right. That's enough of that. So yeah. is that the table view or just the view? Yeah, that's the table view. Table view. That's a table view. Okay, I yeah. Yeah. In one of your view controllers, I saw your property declarations for a split second, and I noticed they were uh, all set as strong, but mm -hmm. almost none of them were not atomic. Right. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, I had a debate a few years ago with another developer about something very similar to that. Um, what he liked to do was he li I, I don't like to expose my internal variables out to the world, so I like to keep everything inside my uh, either my implementation or I might have it as a, uh, a private category. Extension, I might put stuff in there. Um, that way, each controller is responsible for its own data. Some people like to to reach into another controller and, and affect that. And I always say that's a that's a no no. Don't do that. Um, but yeah, okay. I got a yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I noticed you had that that contact rec that you declared as a block variable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right here, oh, right this guy here. Yeah, this doesn't this is, doesn't necessarily have to uh, be a block. So I'm not changing. I'm changing a property of. Well, no, I yeah. I, I want to say I had, a, I had an issue with that. That I'm trying to think here. Well, it like it's right. So. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think the reason why I have it this way is because I'm modifying. Uh, Probably the x coordinate. I don't think you can right. really modify the x coordinate. Out, outside. So if I had like a regular object, then I can affect the methods. But since I'm in the actual property, then it's like, no, you can't do that. I think. But let's see. Well, I, I yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, it wasn't that at all. Um, I might have been a little, a little, a little uh, aggressive with with that, trying to check down bugs. Is is, is my guess. That's that's my guess why I did that. Um, but 
you know, this, this stuff is pretty straightforward for the most part, I think. So, um, but the problem when you start doing stuff like this, you know, in, in code, you, you really start to have issues where, um, in this case, you know, if, if the, uh, if someone had, was searching for something and then tapped the button, like the keyboard was still up. So like, with a, you couldn't get rid of it, you know. So I started having dismissed keyboards, you know, high search results and hack, 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 hack. So anyway. Um, we went over the loop and all right. So I have a couple of things, more things to show you, but we'll kind of get into some of this stuff. Um, protocols, I use protocols as a way to future-proof against additional functionality. In particular, when it comes to things like um, a client will say, we want to pull data from a service. And then later on they say, oh, and we want offline capability. So if I'm writing my stuff against a protocol to begin with, all I have to do is create additional implementation for how it's stored in the device and then I'm done. And so I'm starting to do that more and more just at, at, a, at a habit, just as a, as a pro tip. Uh, plead with server developers for giving DC APIs, because it's, it's a lot of work if they, if they don't. Um, extending your network time minus and solution. Xcode is still terrible with, with provisioning profiles. <laughs> I ran into that today, like, oh, I want to show like, you know, instruments. And it's like, no, it doesn't work. I'm like, OK. Um, but really, you know, understanding UI views uh, UI view controller lifecycle is is will help will go a long way, I think. Um, bounds and frames use differently, so make sure you know what, what those are and understand Grand Central Dispatch. Those are kind of my miscellaneous things off the top of my head. The problem with a talk like this is that it's easy to get right into the weeds, assuming that everyone has you know five to ten years of experience you know with this kind of stuff, and people kind of get mad at you for putting them to sleep. So. Um, so I'll end it there. But I did have another app that I wanted to show you guys, if that's cool. OK. All right. Uh, let's switch over. OK. Come on, come on. You can do it. Or maybe you can't. There we go. All right. So another app. Uh, what do I do with it? Ah, OK. App's called Spree. And this is something I wrote probably two years ago. About two years ago. Now, the problem we ran into with this app is that Everything on these, well, 99% of what you see on the screen is actually vector, vector drawn. It's ridiculous. Can you say that again? Not, like 99% of what you see on the screen right here is there's no images. It's, it's just maybe, maybe the, the top background that's an image, but everything else is all the bevels and gradients and all that, it's all vector. Okay. It's, it's ridiculous. So um, the different states for the buttons, different colors and all that. Um, this course is before the Apple Watch, so we thought it was really awesome. And then got the watch, I was like, well, okay, this app is not very, very good. But um, the idea behind this app was, um, was to kind of track your workouts. So um, I'm kind of going back to my, one of my previous slides about understanding your customer. I don't work out, <laughs> right? So it's, so it's a bad idea for me to create a workout app if I don't actually work out. Sounds obvious, right? Um, so yeah. So we designed this app that looks kind of cool, right? But if you actually use it to work out, it doesn't make any, it's nonsensical. It makes no sense. But it look cool, right? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so another thing that this app would do is it would connect to a Bluetooth um, uh, heart rate monitor. And these guys had this device you start strapped to your head, it would have like a heart rate monitor and like a thermometer. Right? Slide a laser off your skull and, and get all those readings. 
and then it, and then I would pull it across with with the with the Bluetooth LE. Um, um, thank you. Into the app, and then I would display like you know your heart rate and your temperature and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, we're in the zone. How much? That made no sense to me at the time. Like zone, what is that? I don't know what that is. And like, how do you, how do I calculate calories and stuff that's really important, right? So point I'm making about this is that it's kind of cool. We spend a ton of time on this. Now, this is the non-optimized version because this is running scaled up from iOS 6, and it still looks pretty decent, all things considered, I think. Um, and so, so things like, um, like the glows and all that, that's all like core graphics. Now, I'll tell you a secret, paint code is awesome. Paint code is awesome. Paint code would like do like 90% of this stuff. <laughs> right. Paint code. Now the problem with paint code is it, it, so if your designer designs this stuff in paint code and gives it to you, it's great until you have a different device. Right. So you still have to understand how core graphics work because you have to go through and update that code if your designer is no longer with you or, or whatever the case is. Right, so I've had that, I have that a couple of times. Why did I go through and edit the code that it generated? Yes, sir. So was the workflow that they were running paint code? Or yes. Or they would send you assets and you would run it? No, they would create it in paint code and send me the document. Okay. I did the code, copy and paste it. Well, is that right? Right, I'll change some things around. Could you, could you get a, do an end run around that by having them send you, like, Illustrator or any or encapsulate those script assets so that you could well, that would be the idea. That would be ideal. Um, in this case, like the guy was in there for a very short engagement. Here's your design, and poof, kind of flew off, right? So I was kind of stuck with, so work my new device, kind of thing. So because it was code, I could actually work with it, um, but it was a lot of a lot of a lot of work to do that. So um, so we'll go for a run here, and then now you see there's no device detected button here down at the bottom. That's where we do the actual query for Bluetooth devices and talk. So we also did firmware upgrades and all the kind of stuff from the device or from, from the app. And then I'll begin my workout, warn you, no device connected, yada, yada, yada. And then we go. Now, what's interesting about this too is as I'm tapping like the under, let's say tap the time. So you tap it and you have different, different you know, modes for each of these, these cells. So you get a sense of how complicated this is, where we've got 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 different bits of information we're pulling. Not, a, not to mention heart rate, and then my Bluetooth signal, and then what my battery is at the very top. They wanted to see everything in, the, in this app. But yet, they didn't want to go to a second screen to see this. Then we have the other also problem, too, is that if you're putting this in your, in your armband you're running, the screen would turn off, and the app would go to sleep. So there's a little, nice little button on the upper right to keep, keep the display on, which burns out your battery. So sometimes you don't make it to the end of your run, and the device is off. <laughs> so you don't, know, you don't know what you did. Right. So and at its core, it uses a SQLite database. Uh, there's no core data. I initially had core data, but I had problems with it. So I went directly with SQLite and SQL. Um, that seemed to work. Um, um, yes, I used to see version of that. Um, had a map if, you know, I actually have that running. It would show you kind of like your little, your path that, that you ran. And I ran to issues like is if I'm storing each point of your run, it gets to be a lot of data to show on a small screen here. Especially if you start zooming out, you don't need to see all those points. So and there's a lot of optimizations you can do. But the point I'm making ultimately is that, you know, it's pretty, I think, but just was bad design. And, and I'm not going to say it's, you know, it's my fault because I pushed it down to the client store. That's what they wanted. But again, I wasn't in sync with what the customer, how they would use it. So here's an example. Something that looks kind of cool, but is a waste of time. So, I, mean, I hope that makes sense to everybody here. So, Sean, how would the user know to hit that button on the top right to keep your phone screen turned off? They wouldn't. Is that a common paradigm at all? No. 
We need, we need a button, put it there. Oh. That's, that's, that's how we're down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was looking at that before you identified yeah. it. I was like, I have no idea what that Right, right, you know? So, and then, and then we'll finish. Yeah. So, but they want to keep everything on the same screen. So this became a real technical challenge to not move from different screens, but yet reconfigure the tiles and UI and everything else to make that happen. So understanding how views work and view controllers will help you, you know, pretty far in that regard. Or if I'm setting my goal, for example, it's kind of hard to see with the yellow. Can you see that, that dial move a little bit? Um, it's not very accurate. In fact, um, I'm drawing those little divots, so it'll be little divots, um, and recycling them. So it looks like it's an actual dial. So we're having discussions about perspective and all that kind of stuff. But again, at the end of the day, if the user can't use it, it doesn't matter. Why wouldn't you just use like Lego figures for all those things? Well, Yeah, well, the problem with, with their concern was is that I would have to have four different screens for each one. Because normally when you hit a button, when you want to show a picture, you hit a button, you go to the screen, that's the picture, and you come back. Right. Okay. So they wanted something kind of quick to do. And so this was kind of a custom control. So does that scroll like endlessly? Or? No, there's a range where it'll, it'll kind of bounce. So really, it's just a scroll view that's just small enough to fit inside that graphic there that gives the appearance that you're actually spinning it around. So. Reason to go this route instead of just using a navigation controller that would push the view up? Yeah, so that's what they yes, like, that's what they wanted. Okay. Um, and, and for me, it, it wasn't the hill to die on in that, in that respect. So I was like, OK, I'll make what you want. If you don't like it, then I can make something else. Um, that's kind of how that, that went down. And let's see this mark here. Yeah, and these guys here, you know, now, I could reuse a lot of, a lot of how this uh, code um, was built. So these weren't that uh, expensive to make. But again, you know, so much effort was spent on how it looked and not enough on, you know, can you use it? Can it do the one thing it's supposed to do? Yeah. What does the screen mean? I don't understand. So. What is that like the intensity of the activity? Of the well, it, it's, it's your outcome. Like, if you, are you trying to warm up? Or are you trying to get some really heavy cardio? Try to do fat burn? That kind of thing. That's what that's for. Um, and there's VO2 max. So, so what ends up happening is that you, you start to have an app like this that is mainly geared towards, um, I don't call them professionals, but people who really know what they're doing. Right? And the problem with that is they're like, this thing sucks. Right? <laughs> so so you're, 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 too, you're too far for the average person, but not enough for the pro. And so at that point, you're, you're in purgatory, you're no man's land. Right. And those people actually are going to have trainers. They're not going yeah, to right. be for the trainer at yeah. that point. So right. Yeah, they're going to have masks on their face. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Are they still doing this? Oh. Yeah, no, oh, I was going to ask, are they still doing this app? Like, no, no. Um, what did they end? Do you know what happened? I, I really don't know what happened. Um, they wanted an Android version, so they made an Android version of this. and. The team kind of freaked out when they saw just the, the ton of code that they had to translate from Dictacy to Java. Right? There's the only thing, there's really, yeah, that was it. There's really nothing else they could salvage out of that. So I felt bad for them. Like, man, that really yeah, sucks. I mean, especially if you paint code, all, like, all of your graphics are even coded. It's not like, oh, I'm going to take all these assets and <laughs> <laughs> I just right. so <laughs> translate the graphics code. And right. Yes. Calls, yep. Yep. And you always miss those. Yeah. Like every time you do it, things so sideways. I felt bad. Upside down. It's I, I really felt bad. I was like, man, that, that kind of sucks. Well, the, the help line, you know? well, the thing they I think they ran into it was they, you know, had the device on the head, and there was a big debate about why is it on the face, <laughs> right, and not on the wrist. Okay. So, and and remember saying. Well, people are pretty particular about like what they want to wear on their face, right? I mean, glasses, no glasses, you know, hats, hair, no hair, whatever the case is. Ah, that'd be great, right? So they were talking about their science is great, it's awesome, 
you know, and, and these poor um, college students and um, yeah, so these poor college students uh, that were testing the app. Okay, they, were, they actually were testing this app. Um, I think for credit, I don't know how this works, but the professor would say, okay, yeah, I need to get data to make sure to validate, validate your machine works. And so they would have the heart rate, or they had the, heart, the um, headband on, and a probe down the road to get closer to your core temp, and then one up the other side, <laughs> and correlate. <laughs> The, and co so we calibrate the device that way with human test subjects. <laughs> I got some stories, but anyway. <laughs> I didn't have to test it that way, but I was like, man. <laughs> so every app has a story, but this one has one hell of a story. <laughs> um, so all that to say, you know, we, we built the app for the wrong people. Yes? So I got, I got to yeah, ask, yeah. have you ever found yourself in a position where you're seeing the design side of the project mm -hmm. burn a ton of the capital before they figure out whether or not there's a market for what they're building? I have seen that. Okay. And, and I don't really fault the designers in that case. I really, it, it comes down to more of, It, like, it's okay to iterate, right? I mean, people come to me like, oh, I want this, 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 this. I'm like, okay, that's fine, but we gotta start somewhere. We can get there, but if you wanna get there like right now, that's gonna be really expensive, especially if you're wrong, you gotta change it. So, um, and I, I think those kind of iterations, kind of, I've seen that really drain uh, the budget. Because then I have to do something else and then they gotta pay for that and then those mistakes become very expensive. Sure. So, and then there's a lot of you know hoping and praying kind of thing. Um, so, how many man hours and how much money are spent on this? Man hours, probably I probably spent 600 hours on this, roughly. Um, and a big part of what you don't see here is, you know, they want to be able to do like firmware upgrades to these to these 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 things, and I remember, you know, drama really being high pitch when we got a bad firmware <laughs> that got upgraded to these devices right before a marathon. And I was like, dude, don't, if you're gonna drive from Dallas to Austin, make sure like it's tested before you get in the car and drive out there. Then there's another problem where, you know, because you're in the car and it's bouncing up and down, it's sending all this data, right? to nobody, nobody's listening, it's in the bag in the back of the, in, in the car, right, in the trunk. And you get it out and it's dead, right? So, so there's a lot of, I think, focus on the engineering, banana focus uh, on, like, usability. So, they kind of flamed out a little bit because of that. So, anyway, um, I got nothing else, but, uh, when Any questions? You, yeah. Uh, you were talking a little bit about just like shifting the different views around and keeping it on the same page. Mm -hmm. How do you achieve that? Do you have a bunch of zips around or individual, if it's all in code, maybe just UI views and you just shuffle them out in uh, containers? Um, in certain cases, I might do that um, where I'll just replace, so you have your overarching view controller that controls the view and then he'll replace his children view controllers. So he'll do that, so you don't have to go anywhere. Um, other times, I think in this one, it's still the same, but the layout is different. Right, okay. You know, so, I don't I could be wrong. I'm probably, I'm probably just flipping, no, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wrong with that. I'm actually just uh, replacing, the, um, fading in the, the, the old screen with the new screen is what I'm doing. Okay. That's what I'm doing. That seemed to take the least amount of time, all things considered. Um, yeah, any other questions? So, like, I noticed the last two apps you've shown, they yeah. both had uh, navigation doors, one left, one, one, one had, like, left and right. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a common iOS uh, design paradigm, or do they have a plug -in? Like, on Android, it's almost standard. And right. Because, like, I mean, you got, you got to do a lot of work to get that to work? No, not a lot of work. Uh, well, I mean, like, in this case here, right, I mean, I did a little differently with a, well, there's a bug, so it slides over. But then it slides over together. But it's not a, it's not a slide out, it's just a button. Yeah, it's just, it's just, just a button. 
Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. It's not a, it's not a standard iOS UI no. component. Yeah, iOS recommends to not use the, I think, the hamburger menus. In their yep. Don't do it. So uh, that's why they're never going to build that. Yep. So, so the, uh, the solution instead is a tab bar or a uh, right. modal, right? Probably a tab bar. And I, I don't mind that because what it does is it focuses you to decide what's really important. Something like this, you can put, oh, I could look at all that space, man. I could fill it up. So let's do that, right? And they'll just have a ton of options there. Right. It's it's uh, their third party it's library. It's pretty yeah. much been implemented and what comes from what from stock control. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. So yeah, so um, you know, you have four um, pretty much static option choices mm -hmm. right left. Yep. If you had to redo this and it was your and, it, and you had to pay for it, you'd right. probably put it in a, in a tab bar at the bottom. I would. I would. Um, you know, some of this stuff oh, here's another thing too. If you go to information, information's like here's the terms of service. And you get, you know, we see the little icons at the bottom. Yeah. And we're tapping over. Okay, who's going to read that stuff? Yada yada yada. The font's too small anyway. And make sure what this other button does. Oh yeah. We made it. Woo! Right, big full screen. Right, nobody cares. Okay. <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> it's, it's useless. So, <laughs> so in this, so in this case, right, this is something so jarring, right, because now. Now, I gotta go over, and and what they wanted to do, what they wanted to do was they wanted to um, have a way to, to get feedback. Now, from from my paperless app, I was like, hey, you know, let's just bring up a, a simple mail sheet, have a person type in whatever they want, and then go look at it, right? Just keep it simple. But they wanted like, oh, we gotta have these buttons and radio buttons, and it could be this email address. I'm like, mm -mm -mm, keep it simple. It's another pro tip too. For feedback, it's, I think it's really cool just to have an actual, like, straight up email link and be done. Um, I use something called um, U-Track for all my development stuff. And there's a module that actually will go into my mailbox and create actual issues. And I get notified that, oh, so-and-so has, has a question. I'll look at it, and then I'll reply inside the app, and then they get feedback to the email that way. That way I don't drop the ball when someone's like, hey, I emailed you like a week ago, you suck, and here's like one star, you know, for your trouble, that kind of thing. I like the transparency, you can see exactly who it's going to. Like some feedback, yep. where's it going, I don't know. Probably nowhere. Yeah. So, I mean, in this case. That send button doesn't do anything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and also, too, is I know, know like what version that they're dealing with, so if it's like an old version, say upgrade, you know, that kind of thing. So. Um, that's how I do it now. I deal with that situation, and then I might have, then I might link that issue with an actual, you know, bug that I need to track it, and then I'll email the person back and say, "Hey, I think I fixed your bug. You know, check out the, the new version. Thanks for responding, or whatever the case is." And that's just basic customer service. What's the name of that? Huh? So what was the name of the? Um, it's called U Track. U Track. Mm -hmm. So. Just want support, nothing but support, yep. which is nice. Yep. And has similar style to Do you get people who uh, complain that the device that you auto generate is wrong? Because it's the iOS device, yeah. not the actual phone's name, because it was like an iPhone 7 2, and people are like, What does that mean? 6, what are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. Well, in this case, you know, yeah. I don't. I don't even do that in mine. I just. I just ask him. You know, what kind of device do you have? And because I don't like to, to to be pulling that kind of information to send it across email. Yeah. I'll ask them for that, and then if they want to give it to me, which they usually do. It's their choice. So, um, I mean, that's how I did with that situation. But you know, previous apps, there was never any type of way of getting feedback besides, you know, you get a one star, and a guy's like, your app sucks, and this guy never responded to me, and you find out, oh yeah, he did email me, but it's in my, my spam folder or right. whatever, and you feel kind of crunchy for that. But um, you know, not really technical, but 
also very important to get stuff on the App Store. People can contact, yes? Uh, the way that you show that you're sending the feedback in this case, mm -hmm. are you saying that's the way you prefer or it's not the way you prefer? No, I don't like it because. So the way that you do it, is it, is it consistent with the interface or does it still go to an email client? Well, it, 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 st it still does. But the problem I have in this case is if I hit that button, if I can tap on it, nope, come on, is that I switch to the screen and then it shows the, the client, right? right? So it's two steps. So are you opening that in a new view controller? Yeah, I'm using the mail, whatever it is. Yeah, Composer. Yeah, I forget the name of it, but yeah, I'm using that. Now, if, I'm, if I can contrast it with my, with my app now, my stuff here. Um, you know, it literally is stuff at the bottom, right? That's it. Receipts, settings, options you need it, and then you can actually tap on that, email us, right? That seems kind of funky, and that's it. And it, it keeps it keeps it simple. You got a shot there. That's a cool. <laughs> So, you know, yes, I spent $50,000 on something <laughs> on, that, on my instrument uh, view. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it, I guess I might talk there, but do uh, um, you guys have any questions? Any more questions? No? Awesome. Yes? Uh, so, like, when, right now we're in the middle of a, a, a beta for iOS 9. Mm -hmm. Right about now is when I start messing with that because, yeah, I've, I've had I've been burned before. I remember sitting with you on the day <laughs> iOS six came out, iOS seven came out. You had an app on it. Was the day that it came out, and people started emailing you that it wasn't working. It was six. Six. Um, yep, it was six. Yeah, we were here. Yeah. I, and uh, that's that's when I was doing still stuff for the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs and they were on it. Like, this app's broken. Like, dude, like, it just came out. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> like, like two hours ago. I mean, what was I supposed to do? Yeah. I yeah. think they just stopped people on a beta OS not being able to leave a review on Yeah, I can't app. believe it's yeah. taken so long to do that. Yeah. Now you, you have to that you run can be, beta. oh, your yeah. app crashed. We open it up. Anybody that wants to can be on the beta OS, and it took them this long to say you're not allowed to put app reviews in if you're running the beta OS. Yeah, because we have, I've always had problems with that before on the beta. And then they su submit to your app, like, oh, your app's broken and crashes all the time. And well, like, you can't fix it. Oh, yeah, I'm like, you're on you the beta. I'm working on it. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just came out yesterday. Yep. <laughs> just <laughs> beta. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so I mean, my, my track record is I, I, I start to do that now. Um, but I have other devices. If I'm still not quite sure, then I'll say, well, my 6 Plus will get iOS 9, for example. I'll test it out. If it's great, then I'll put on my, my 6. So that's what I do. Anything else? No? Well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks,